Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Wednesday, March 22nd edition of the Basement Academy. I want to dive into our morning psalm to give us plenty of time for today's reflection on the call of being a pastor around the teaching and preaching ministry. And so I, I look forward to sharing some thoughts with you. But let's begin with Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who finds great delight in his commands. His children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness light dawns for the upright, for the gracious and compassionate and righteous man. Good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice. Surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. He will have no fear of bad news. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure. He will have no fear. In the end, he will look and triumph on his foes. He has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked man will see and be vexed. He will gnash his teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Mm. Love that psalm. It's kind of a parallel or companion psalm to Psalm 1 about the one who meditates on God's word day and night and planted by the stream of living water bearing fruit. May it be so, Lord. May it be so. Okay, I uh, want to continue some thoughts on what it's like to be a pastor. Um, talked yesterday about Sundays and landed on this, the, the, the challenge of Sundays is they come every week. <laughs> and every week we have to preach. <laughs> There's a sermon uh, that is to be a part of that and a significant, it's the major part, really, it, you know, of an hour-long service. It's nearly half of that between reading the Word and then unpacking it and teaching it and kind of the closing prayer around that, it sometimes is 25, 28, 30 minutes. And some of you are keeping score, and I know that. <laughs> um, and so uh, let me talk about not just preaching, but I, I put up on the whiteboard teaching because in my mind, that's where it starts. My own life, I, I, I was not planning to be a pastor. I think I've shared that. I... As I came to faith in Christ, I had a life-changing encounter with the Word of God through Bible study and through the, the message that I heard uh, in our fellowship groups as well as on Sunday mornings at Trinity Presbyterian Church in Charlottesville. But I just appreciated people who systematically taught the Word of God, unpacked the context, the history, the meanings of certain words, um, what Paul was writing about in Ephesians, what you know Moses was doing at the burning bush. You know, as, as I heard more, it just my my heart came alive, and so I want to provide. I've always wanted to provide others with the same opportunity I've had to to be able to explain the Word of God, to, to read it, to preach it, to teach it, to unpack it, to explain the context because there are contextual issues that are hard to understand in our modern world so that, so that your life can change. Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord, Deuteronomy 8, and then Jesus quotes that. Um, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. It, it discerns thoughts, motives, intentions. It's like a scalpel, as it were. It kind of gets in and, and cuts out things out of our lives, but heals us and restores us. And so I, I want you to have that experience uh, with the living uh, Word of God. Romans 12, uh, 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind as you understand God's Word and His nature and His being and His character and, and His Son Jesus and the meaning of Jesus' words and, and the call on the Christian. As you understand all these things, you will live a different life. You will be transformed. Um, uh, an early passage that meant a lot to me when I was doing youth ministry, Acts chapter 6. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so I have taken that as a, 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 sh a kind of a paradigmatic. It shapes my understanding. I'm called to pray and to minister God's word. A lot of other stuff I got to do. 
but it's prayer and the ministry of the word that, that drives it. Um, uh, the Great Commission. Uh, go, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go to all nations, all peoples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So the apostles are commissioned to teach. And then the early church, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Hmm. And so they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, after he, he says that, that Christ, the ascended Christ, gave gifts to the church, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. But in the original language, the word and isn't there. It's pastor-teacher. And I had it explained to me early on that the pastor pastors through teaching. Now, a lot of people think of the pastor, oh, the pastor is the one who does the visitations and comforts us and uh, officiates our weddings and does our baptisms and, uh, you know, cares for us uh, at time of death and, and leads the funeral. And yes, those things are true, but that's not the primary work of the pastor. The primary work of the pastor is to teach, as I understand from the, from the word of God. And so we are shepherded through the word. So I have always come to the pastoral work of preaching from a teaching standpoint. So that's why I put it this way here. So am I a teaching preacher or a preaching teacher? Wait a second, you're saying the same thing. There are some who are just preachers, right? And they just see themselves Sunday morning, I'm getting proclaiming the gospel. In, in the Baptist tradition, often the pastor will be called preacher, right? So when folks will refer to me as the preacher, I'll often assume they've got a little bit of a Baptist background somehow because the preacher proclaims the gospel and then calls for faith every Sunday, makes an altar call. In case you've noticed, I don't do it quite that same way. So am I a, pre am I a teacher who preaches? That am, I, am I a preaching teacher or am I a teaching preacher? Little nuance of difference. I guess the answer is yes, I, I'm both of those. Um, let, let me talk about my approach to the pulpit in particular, okay? So well, one thing about teaching, my early sense of call was around teaching. Um, uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, Sunday school classes at the church where I was a youth minister. I was not teaching the youth, but I also would teach an adult Sunday school class. And at 24, 25 years old, I had no business doing that. But, you know, I got interviewed by the Christian ed department. It was a pretty big church, 1,500 members. And, and I guess I passed muster and they said, okay, you can try one. And they kind of watched me and said, okay, okay, you're not running off the rails, so you know, so keep doing it. When I was in seminary, I did my field ed at a local Christian high school. So for two years, I was a Bible teacher and chaplain um, in a local church while in seminary. Again, as a 30-year-old, I'm teaching a Sunday school class, and there's one of my seminary professors sitting in the class, and I'm going, I, what am I doing? I'm crazy. There was kind of a an audacious quality to me. I think that probably still is there, but I just love the word and seem to enjoy communicating. And it seems as if people have been helped. Um, and so in First Pres Boulder, before I came to Greenwich, I had a morning Bible study that we, uh, many of us enjoyed and it, it grew gently over time, though it was pretty early in the morning, early risers. One of those uh, members is participates in the Basement Academy in our in our discussion group on Wednesday. So shout out to Jim uh, Carpenter. And then COVID restored or recovered a sense of call to teaching. Now, I, when I came to Greenwich, immediately started, you know, I went and said, hey, I'd love to teach a pastor's class. We only had two services at the time. And so I just started teaching a class in the fellowship hall. And the search committee is like, we don't want you to, that wasn't in your job description. And, and we don't want you to feel burdened. I'm like, that is only my job description. <laughs> I don't care what's written on paper. This is what pastors do. They teach. Or this is what this pastor does. We'll say it that way. I don't want to you know, point the finger at anybody else. But this pastor understands the call to teach. 
And so I just started teaching a pastor's class. And then we added a third service and that class went away. And to the dismay of many, because that was a, a meaningful expression. And then when we went to our new building, you know, went back to teaching the pastor's class. COVID kind of took that away and we've kind of squeezed the, the, the class, the, the, the service times together. But I still, you know, did a, did a class with Heather Sorensen on Sunday, pastor's class. So I've always had a sense of, of teaching and, and the Basement Academy has recovered that sense of teaching. And so many have said, how can you keep doing it? I don't know, but I think it's because this is what I was made to do. So I'm a teaching preacher, a preaching teacher, you know. Um, essentially, um, so let, let me talk you through my, my week. So every Sunday I've got to produce a message. And so I'll spend about six to eight hours starting with the text or the topic because, you know, either we'll do a, a text, a, a book study where we're just taking chapter after chapter after chapter, or we'll do a topical series like we are now with grace and judgment. And I'll take the passage of the week that I've selected and unpack that. I want to make sure that we're, you know, right with context, history, word studies. But the key is to bridge from the ancient world to the modern world. And how is this old, old word relevant and how does it apply uh, today? And that's where the challenge is, right? And so I'll spend, you know, in the course of the week um, and I'll, I'll prepare a new message each week. And that's the challenge. Every week in the midst of everything else that's going on, I have to pull aside, be out of the traffic patterns at Greenwich and to get quiet and still and to think and to pray. And I just, you know, have my own method. I just write down thought after thought after thought, you know, and then I'll, I'll have pages and pages of notes. Uh, and then I'll, start to draw little circles and lines about where where there's a connection, the themes that, okay, we're gonna, now it starts to shape an outline. And so, uh, you know, coming up with how we open, you know, to, to draw people's attention and then to move into the text and give some context and the impact of that context and the word and then to apply it somehow, either in something we're to believe or to know uh, or to do you know, kind of that pastoral aspect of application and so kind of the so what out of the passage. Okay, so this is true, so what? And then to apply that in the context of today's life or, you know, kind of as, as if you were here on Sunday, uh, you know, the, the grace and judgment, heaven and hell, let's just not worry about who's going to hell. <laughs> let's just quit, where, let's just worry about ourselves and let's just, lean in, let's keep turning towards God. But then the, the, the very tender reality, each of us have folks we know who we love and care about who seem to be far away from God. And, and so just trying to speak, you know, at that level also. So that's part of the, of the, of the work and the challenge of the pulpit is to apply um, that. Uh, we'll, we'll go through a, a series, uh, uh, several series in the course of the year, uh, we pray about those. Uh, we discuss, Eric and I, we'll, we'll shape that out. Typically, there'll be something that runs from the new year up to Lent. We'll do a Lenten series. We'll do a post-Easter series, a summer series, a fall series, and then we get Advent. And so, you know, it'll be from six to eight weeks up to, you know, 12 or 13 weeks. And, you know, Advent is four weeks with a couple weeks of Christmas. And so, um you know, we think about it, we pray about it, but it is a, you know, it's it's kind of a centerpiece to Sundays, and some folks are coming for that, right? And and some of the feedback and periodically criticism uh, I receive uh, is around what I've said, where folks may may find issue with it, and I I welcome that. Um, so let let me just think out loud for a few minutes about some kind of principles um, that I've just come to over time or kind of maybe life lessons from a teaching preacher. Um, hungry people, people who bring their Bibles, people who are hungry for the Word of God themselves make us, make me a better teacher and preacher. You leaning in makes me lean in. 
And when I lean in, maybe you lean in a little further. And then I'll, you leaning in further makes me lean in further. And so we take this call seriously. I take the call to teach and preach with integrity very seriously. So, so thank you for leaning in. And keep asking theological questions, pastoral and practical. Keep, keep challenging me because that, that keeps me sharp. Um, the challenge around teaching and preaching is, particularly preaching on Sundays, is we've got folks... I don't know where everybody is in their Bible knowledge, their background, so I have to, you know, I try to tell some basic stories again. Now, for me, you know, I've got certain key foundational stories. Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, creation and fall are, are foundational. The Exodus, Moses, um, you know, the wilderness wanderings, the Psalms are always there, the praying life, uh, the prophets in the larger sense, particularly around exile. So, Creation, fall, uh, call to Abraham, uh, Moses, uh, the, the exodus, the exile. These are themes that are always uh, in the teaching and preaching. And then, of course, Jesus, uh, the incarnation, uh, the, the Beatitudes, um, the love one another, this command to love, uh, obviously the cross and the resurrection. And then this call to be in Christ or to be formed in Christ. So there's certain themes that bubble up out of my own teaching and preaching, and I've come to those over time. I think those are foundational stones for the way I think about the Christian life. Um, so I'm always trying to help people see the forest and the trees and to discern the forest from the trees, and so I'll try to do some big picture stuff, but I'll also try to go narrow. I don't know that I'm always as successful as I, I could be or should be, but, but I'm trying to do that. Um, I will try to touch on some issues of the day, but not. I'm not going to go preach after, you know, for example, after the Roe versus Wade uh, ruling was reversed last summer. Some of my presbytery colleagues were scrapping their sermons and preaching about that thing. Not me. I'm just going to stay on path you know, um, but, I, but I spoke to Roe v. Wade here at the Basement Academy, right? Um, and so I'll touch on issues of the day when it's time for elections. You know, I'm, I'm never going to go in a partisan politics. Um, I, I think there's commendable realities on both sides of the aisle in, in the, the blue team and the red team. Both call forward and call forth um, um, things that Christians should pay attention to. But politics are never the ultimate reality. The kingdom of God is. Christ is. And so, you know, I'm always trying to call us to a higher place. And it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter to me who you vote for and what team you affiliate with politically. Because that's irrelevant because you still got to love God, heart, mind, soul, and strength. You still have to love your neighbors yourself. And if you see that red teamer or blue teamer as an enemy, well, then you just signed yourself up to go love that person. Because Jesus taught us to love your enemies, right? So, um, so I have people all the time wanting me to preach in a partisan manner. Why don't you preach on this topic or that topic? Because that's not given me the opportunity. This is the pulpit of the Lord Jesus, not of it's not a bully pulpit for for Don Meeks. Um, I do believe everything is means to a chief end of glorifying God and enjoying Him forever. And I believe the way we glorify and enjoy God is as our character is transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. That's what Romans 8 talks about, that he is going to be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. He will be the one. We will be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what God is doing, is transforming our character into a Christ-like character. So our work, our relationships, our family, our marriage, our church, uh, our hobbies, our voting, our money, all of these things are means to this chief end. And so I'm always trying to speak in, in, and teach in, in that direction. Um, um, I tend to include myself uh, in the application. So I know some preachers who believe you should only speak to you, the congregation, need to do this. I always say we, us, our. I consider myself amongst the flock. And so I preach to myself uh, as, as much uh, to the congregation. Um, 
uh, I've heard folks talk about this and I, I kind of tend to do this preach as if it was your last Sunday or preach if it's, it's the only time you're going to get a chance to bring that message to somebody. And so I tend to preach with a little bit of sense of urgency. Um, I, it probably should be more urgent than it is. You know, somebody, this might be the last son, sermon anybody heard on Sunday. And so I want to make sure they hear clearly the opportunity to hear the gospel. So I'm always, I love that cross that hangs above the pulpit there, you know, at the front of the sanctuary. I'm always trying to point to the cross. Um, the Apostle Paul said, I resolve to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. And so I'm always trying to point to the cross. Forgive me when I don't, um, because that's where the action is. That's where heaven and earth come together. We meet at the foot of the cross as, as uh, humbled sinners, repentant sinners, but they are forgiven sinners as we cling to that old rugged cross. And so that's the preaching side of it, right? I'm teaching, 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 but I always want to preach uh, Jesus and him crucified. Um, I do believe um, that God's word can change people's lives. And so I believe in divine appointments that a visitor might be in the church for only one Sunday ever. And I pray and believe their life can be changed forever. Somebody might tune into the Basement Academy, you know, one time only or a Sunday school class one time only. And so I want to, I don't want to mail anything in, right? I want to be there. I want to, you know, actively engage heart, mind, soul, and strength with the Word of God and, and try to provide an opportunity for somebody's life to change that day because it certainly did with me uh, so many years ago. You'll notice I don't tell many cute stories. I, I don't uh, share lots of illustrations. You know, Max Lucado, Charles Stanley, um, Chuck Swindoll, uh, so many of these wonderful teachers and preachers. They're wonderful. I just, that's just not who I am. I just don't think that way. For me, that would be inauthentic, a little cheesy. Um, nor do I manuscript. So we were taught in seminary to write every single word out like it was a speech that you then would read, but then you can kind of commit it to memory. And I did that for the first many years of my, my preaching life as a pastor. And I found it was Saul's armor. Now, if you know the story, David, the runt of the litter, you know, his brothers are out there. Goliath is, is there. His brothers are in Saul's army and Goliath is defying Saul in the army. And David goes to deliver some food and he goes, who, who is this guy? He's defying the God of, you know, uh, Israel. And so he says, hey, I'll go fight him. And so Saul puts his armor on David and David's clunking about. Well, that's not how he fights. He fights with a little sling and some stones. He can kill the lion and the bear. <laughs> and so he goes and kills the giant. And I realized manuscripting a sermon was Saul's armor to me. That's just not who I am. It's not how I, how I work. And so I, I write a very heavy outline and give myself talking points. And I've got my own little, you know, um, notation for, for what to do and how to say things. I've got shorthand, my own little shorthand I've developed. And so I take one piece of paper into the pulpit now. <laughs> I take one piece of paper uh, into the pulpit and, you know, can talk for, you know, 25 minutes. Just like, and that's how I'm doing these basement academies. It's a, it's a series of, of talking points. Um, you notice I don't make the altar call. It's not that I don't believe that's appropriate. It's just I don't believe it's necessary. I believe God is big enough <laughs> to convict the heart and to draw uh, people to himself. And so I want to proclaim the gospel, invite people to embrace Jesus Christ, but I'm not going to make that moment and every head bowed, every eye closed. And I, I just don't, that's not my tradition and maybe it should be, but, but I don't. Um, at Christmas and Easter are always challenging because everybody knows the story. But it's everybody knowing the story that presents the challenge because we know the story so well, we just click, we tune out. Oh yeah, we know where this one goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. He rises from the dead on the third day. Yep, yep, got it. Okay, uh, let's go get the ham out of the oven. So how to teach and preach uh, Christmas and Easter when everybody knows what's coming. Everybody knows the punchline. And to come at that uh, in a fresh way 
uh, is always a challenge. So anyway, so these are some thoughts. Uh, sorry, it's gone a little long, uh, but trying to let you kind of behind the, um, uh, the, the curtain. Uh, pray for me. Pray for Eric. Pray for your Sunday school teachers, all who bring God's word. Um, it's, it's a heavy task. It's a heavy burden. We take it seriously. I take it seriously. I know Eric does. Um, and we remember what uh, James wrote about we who teach will be judged more strictly. I don't want to lead anybody astray. And so to that end, I'm going to invite you to pray with me now, okay? And so, Father, we do pray with gratitude for the Word of God and those who have ministered the Word of God to us over the many years of our lives. Our parents, our Sunday school teachers, youth group leaders, television preachers, radio preachers, local pastors, um, books that have ministered your Word. May your Word continue to shape our lives, uh, living in active word, shaping our lives, transforming uh, our lives by the renewal of our mind and lead us into an obedience to Jesus Christ uh, and into the, to the character of Christ. And so Lord, if anything I've said today or any day is untrue, unhelpful, unholy, unwise, Lord, would you blow it away with the wind of your spirit but cause that which is true and living and abiding to remain that we might bring forth a fruit to your glory. For we pray in the name of Jesus, the living word, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, may Jesus, the incarnate and living word, draw close to you, abide in you through the written word, through the power of the Holy Spirit. May he do that this day and forevermore. Amen.